Good morning. My name is James Little and my company is Mass Spec Interpretation Services. Today my presentation is Approaches for Identifying New Psychoactive Substances. Many resources for today's talk can be found on my personal website, A Little Mass Spec in Sailing. This will include today's workshop presentation and a workshop handout with links to many resources on my website. You can see that the arrow shows here as you come into the website it will show that this presentation and associated resources will be available on the day of the talk. Also on the website are free tutorials and handouts for a variety of analytical resources and much additional content that was not pres presented at the Forensic NIST 22 workshop. I'm a retired research fellow from Eastman Chemical Company with over 42 years experience. Below you can see our largest site, which is in Kingsport, Tennessee, but we have 50 other manufacturing sites worldwide with a total of approximately 14,500 employees. And at these sites, we have over 50 mass specs that are networked and they're used for a variety of R&D applications. Since retiring from Eastman, I started my own company and have six years consulting at Mass Spec Interpretation Services where my passion is unknown identification using GCMS, LCMSMS, and many other techniques. A review article in LCGC outlines Eastman's approach for unknown identifications. The basic philosophy is that in many cases someone knows the identity of my unknown, I just need to find that information, thus the term known unknowns. I feel that many of the substances that are of interest to you are known by other people, we just need to figure out a way to determine what that structure might be. I got this term known unknowns from Donald Rumsfeld in one of his famous quotes that is shown below. We had many tools in our toolkit at Eastman to identify known unknowns. Those included sample history and known components in the mixtures. If you knew a component in the mixture, it was often very useful to correlate it to the unknown's identity commercial MSMS and EI libraries using the NIST search, accurate mass analyses to determine the molecular formula of unknowns and their fragment ions, spectralist databases such as the CAS registry and ChemSpider that we'll, we will discuss in detail later, chemical ionization is very important because many compounds do not have a molecular ion and these the molecular weights of these compounds can be easily determined by chemical ionization. We also developed training courses for the NIST EI and MSMS search software utilized within Eastman that I now have shared on my personal website. We had extensive EI and MSMS corporate user libraries that were shared and updated automatically nightly. NIST MS interpreter fragmentation program is used to correlate the unknown structure to fragments present in the EI spectrum. NMR was utilized in conjunction with mass spec to identify the unknowns, and synthesis of enriched samples by known chemistry, that's the key point, known chemistry in small quantities can be confirmed by NMR and mass spec without need for purification to confirm the identity of the unknown. We use deuterium exchange CIGCMS, and the same for MSMS but using infusion. Derivatization for GCMS is particularly important, especially using trimethylsilyl, in other words, TMS derivatives, because many of the commercial databases have components present as their TMS derivative and wouldn't even GC unless the, they were silylated. Known unknowns can be identified with spectralist databases, that is, databases which contain no directly searchable spectra. We detail our work in this area in the Journal of the American Society for Mass Spectrometry using either SciFinder to probe the CAS registry or ChemSpider. If you look at the total number of EI spectra and MSMS spectra that can be searched for unknown identification, there's only about 1.2 million each of those. Those really pale in comparison to the 50 million records in ChemSpider with structures and the 127 million records in the CAS registry. And there's about 15,000 new 
entities added each day to the CAS registry. This is a huge number of records and associated structures in ChemSpider and the CAS registry, and they're very useful for finding candidate structures for unknowns. ChemSpider is free, and there's a fee associated with the CAS registry. You can search the CAS registry by molecular formula and molecular weight, and you can search ChemSpider by molecular formula and accurate mass data. Accurate mass data is very important as compounds get have a molecular weight greater than about 500 because it's really hard to get one distinct molecular formula with compounds with such a high molecular weight. After you get the candidate structures from these databases, they're refined by keywords, the number of associated references, substructure, and other information to come to a list of final, hopefully one final candidate or a few final candidates that can be reviewed and compared to your fragmentation data, sample history, and other information to come up with a proposed identity for the unknown. When utilized with structures proposed by mass spec, NMR can be very useful for identifying unknowns even in mixtures. Components confirmed of the mixture by NMR can be quantified and then used as standards for calibrating routine chromatographic techniques. Primary standards are not needed for quantitation by NMR when an internal standard is added to the mixture. High field NMRs used at Eastman employ cryogens and are expensive to purchase and maintain. New lower field tabletop systems use permanent magnets at a much lower associated cost. And I believe that the latter type system, even though limited in sensitivity and resolution, could still be very useful for many applications in other laboratories that could not afford the high expense of high field NMRs and their associated maintenance. The main topic I will discuss today is the novel NIST EI hybrid search. It was developed by researchers working under Steve Stein at NIST, and the following reference at the bottom of the page is very useful in trying to understand how the search works. Program description is the hybrid search generates both a similarity score matching fragments and then also one matching neutral losses. This greatly extends the scope of the library. The mass difference must be confined to a single region of the molecule and no significant alteration of the fragmentation behavior must be noted. Delta mass is the molecular weight difference between the query and the library compound and reflects the modification of the molecule. My personal experience, I've used it for more than 40,000 searches in three years in evaluating new EI library spectra for NIST. I'm routinely amazed by the types of similar compounds with high match factors that are noted. They frequently yield useful results not noted in a simple identity search. This is very useful in identifying unknowns, finding similar model compounds, and supporting fragmentation mechanisms. It first searches the unknown standard spectrum against all the library spectra and generates a standard identity match factor like a normal search that you're normally used to doing. So here's the standard fragment ion spectrum. But then it searches the unknown neutral loss spectrum of the unknown against all the library neutral loss spectra. And for this same component, here's the neutral loss spectrum of a, one of the reference library spectra. You can see normally here you just have the mass to charge versus intensity, but here it calculates the loss. So at the molecular ion would be loss of a zero. It has a one here because of the isotope because it's positive from the molecular ion. But then it shows losses, minus 84, minus 163. And then it compares all of these neutral loss spectra of the reference against that of the unknown. When it gets through, it generates a combined hybrid score, which is a mixture of the two different scores. So now let's do an unknown. Our unknown shown in the bottom left hand corner here. We do our hybrid search and our best hybrid search match factor is 908 and the next closest is 781 as you can see in this column. The delta mass is 18 which is common for fluorine mass to 
mass 19 replacing a hydrogen on the molecule to give a 19 minus 1 equals a delta mass of 18. But as I told you before, you can see the standard identity results in addition to the hybrid total results. So all you have to do is resort the hybrid search results table by the standard identity search match factor, and that's called OMatch. And so all I'll do is click on this in this column. It'll resort, and now all of the matches will be sorted in descending order. And if you look at these first 24, all of them on this ring with the bromine have a fluorine taking the place of a hydrogen. So in addition to finding out that it added a fluorine by resorting the, the original match standard identity match factors, one can get an idea of some of the substructures that might lead to our unknown identification. So what we have to do is mentally merge this information of the hybrid and simple identity EI search. It really just doesn't give you a result. It gives you information, and then you have to put it together. So we have our unknown spectrum. We have our hybrid search best result that we know is uh, different by 18, so we have to put a fluorine on the molecule. We know that the fluorine looks like it from the top 24 results, that the fluorine is on the aromatic ring with the bromine to give this mass to charge 187 that's common in all of these compounds. And then you put it together to find the unknown identification, which is the structure drawn below, or an isomer. After the search is completed, the user can compare any spectrum in the hit list to that of the unknown. And here's the middle display that does that. On the top, we have the unknown. And we have in the bottom the hybrid spectrum, in this case, for the best fit that I found in the library search. It'll take a while to get used to this display. In the bottom spectrum, the original ions in gray are shifted by the delta mass 18 for use, user visual comparisons. This can take a while to adjust to this view versus the standard head-to-tail views we see in our standard searches. But in general, let's look at it. We have any ion that's gray has been shifted by the delta mass of 18 for comparison purposes to 107. Any ion such as the blue here was not shifted. It was an ion that was not needed to be shifted. It was actually a fragment ion. So the program decides, decides what should be shifted and what should not be shifted to generate these hybrid scores. And you can see all of the ones with the delta are, have been shifted to a colored ion in the spectrum. So after you look at it for a while, you have to get used to ignoring the gray and looking at the colored on the bottom, which is our best fit that we're comparing to the all the colored ions on the top, which are unknown. And when you get through with that, you can kind of see why the fit was so good for this, even though a standard fit would be down in the 500s, the hybrid fit was up toward 900. But if you're getting used to use this, sometimes I would use the neutral loss display. And again, the top is unknown, and the bottom is the hybrid spectrum. In this case, what it does is it takes the neutral loss spectrum of your best hit or any other spectrum that you want to compare and calculates its neutral loss spectrum, so you can see it's at zero, and compares it to the neutral loss spectrum of our unknown. And you can see that they're very, that's where the similarity occurs. There's so many neutral losses that occur that are matching it up, and that plus some of the fragments give you this very high hybrid score that would have yielded a very low standard identity search by itself. And it is easier and more efficient to look at the hybrid display, but it just takes a little experience. After one deduces a structure from the hybrid search data, the powerful NIST MS interpreter program is used to correlate ions to structures. In this program, Ions in color and black are explained by the program. Ions in white are not explained. Isotope ratios are shown compared to theoretical ones. Logical fragments are defined. And mechanisms and relative fragmentation rates are noted. Detailed descriptions can be found in my free course for the use and setup of this powerful program. I wanted to do a quick live demo of the MS Interpreter program. If you go out here, I've got it already set up. If you click on the
this particular ion here. This is the molecular ion for our proposed structure. And you can see up in the top window is our isotope calculator. The ions in black are the ones that are observed in the spectrum. The ones in color are the theoretical ones. So you can see it's a very good match for the bromine content in the compound. And if you come down to the next ion and click on it, it shows you in color what the proposed part of the molecule is. So this is lost a methyl group. But again, it also shows you these little yellow lines that shows you that the isotope pattern or the theoretical fragment shown in red matches the black observed in the spectrum. You can keep clicking on them. These are all the ones that contain bromine. This has lost a CF3 group and a fluorine. And it tells you something about the loss and the type of loss and the reaction rates. The little bar above here. And sometimes there might be more than one proposed structure for an ion. If it does, you can click through them as shown in some of my training videos. I don't see one right now that has more than one. There's another one. Here, here's one that doesn't have the bromine on it. And again, the isotope pattern matches well. And down further, even smaller fragments. 69 is the CF3 group here. So all of them uh, match very well. Uh, this is one that shows the fluorine loss here, this point in the, in the compound. The other thing you can do if you want to, if you know exactly what the fragment is, you can come and circle it here and directly determine what it is without having to click on it. So it thinks that's that fragment there. So that's a good match for that. And at this point, you can also send it to this isotope calcul calculator window by clicking on the formula. Uh, let's get it again. I lost it here. Get it again. And right click on the send. So I did a right click, and it'll send it up here so you can see it in this window in addition to the yellow lines if you like. So this gives you somewhat of an overview. So again, all the ions in color have some explanation by MS uh, interpreter. And the ones uh, in white, it doesn't know. So you can see this, our proposed structure is a very good fit for the EI mass spectrum of this compound. The hybrid search needs nominal molecular weight of the species to work properly. And many EI spectra do not have a molecular ion. There's approximately 20% in the library that do not have them. So thus, the user must decide by either letting the program determine it automatically. The user can propose from logical losses at higher mass to charge in the spectrum from the molecular ion. Chemical ionizations can be a very useful technique. And also, there are several algorithms within the NIST software for estimating the molecular weight of the unknown. Here is a useful hybrid delta mass values that were obtained in my spectral evaluations for NIST. There are approximately 600 values in this table, and the value can be noted plus or minus depending on the species present or absent. I think that you will find these very useful in trying to do your identifications with the hybrid search. I thought it would be useful to associate some simple structures with delta mass values. Note when you have a, a delta mass change by an odd number, such as below, where you have a benzene going to a pyridine type ring, the delta mass is 1, or an odd number. And that's similar to the nitrogen rule that one would have in EI spectra. Isotope ratios, or accurate mass, can be helpful with redundancies. So here we have two different examples where a delta mass of 2, one that has a chlorine in the difference, and the other one where a phenol goes to a methyl group that also has a delta mass of 2. But of course, the one with the chlorine would definitely show the change of the isotope due to chlorine. It would be obvious that the delta mass would be this type of transformation. This is one at the bottom that I found particularly interesting. When you have a benzene type species and it goes to a naphthalene type species with all of these could have substituents on the ring, but the difference would be a benzene versus a naphthalene, the delta mass is 50. And this is very useful because there's a lot of substituted benzenes in the databases or in the libraries, but not as many naphthalenes. So you can use the benzene spectra 
to find naphthalene compounds or to infer that, that it is a naphthalene compound when the naphthalene compound is not actually present in the database using the hybrid search. And then the similar thing can occur when you have a benzene going to a naphthalene type ring with a nitrogen in the ring. Of course, it would be 50, but in this case, since it has the nitrogen, the delta mass observed for this substituted aromatic ring here with the nitrogen in it versus the benzene would be a delta mass of 51. And again, this is a good way to find this type of species when they're not present in the library by inferring their structure from the benzene. And of course, these, are, these substructures or structures can be a part of a very larger molecule uh, with different substituents on the ring. The values in my current delta mass table are only in nominal mass such that you might have many things with a delta mass of 34 to show many different transformations between groups on the compound. But of course, if you looked at them by accurate mass differences, they would be all distinct and different. So that would be a nice addition if you were using accurate mass data for changing the table to be more useful. Of course, hybrid searches can also be used for LC, MS, MS unknowns. And I've described this on a separate course on my website. So in this example, we have the unknown MSMS -MS spectrum at the bottom. We can find that the spectrum has been changed by or shifted by 34 units, which is the difference of the chlorine, 35, replacing that of a hydrogen, 1, to give the 34 difference, the delta mass. And also, if you resort by the identity searches here, you can show that there are two chlorines on the benzyl ring for many of the top 20 choices in the list. So again, you just have to put these two pieces together to find that it's an isomer of the dichlorinated species that wasn't present in the library but can be inferred from the hybrid search. Now I want to share with you a real-world example of the identification of a fentanyl-related compound. This work was done by myself and David Sparkman at the University of the Pacific. And in this white powder, we used the hybrid, NIST hybrid search to get a proposed structure, some Wiley know-it-all infrared searches to get some additional confirmation of the structure, and finally, some additional data obtained by a search of a spectralist database, ChemSpider. I'll now walk you through the software to show you the identification of the unknown. Up in the left corner, you can see the spectra that will be worked on in the process. And over here, after I select that spectrum, you can see the unknown spectrum, which has a molecular weight apparently of 248. So now we'll do the hybrid search. Hit the Go button. And it's searching about uh, 1.4 million compounds in 23 libraries to give some proposed structures from the hybrid search. If we go to the bottom of the software here, you can see the best match as a fit, a match factor of 813. And now what I'll do is just step through some of them. The, the real important part here is the delta mass is 16, which would indicate possibly the insertion of an oxygen in the, to the structure of the unknown as compared to the best hybrid search. I'm going to use my keypad to step through the list. So I'm on my keypad using the up and down arrows to step through them. And as I step through them, you'll see the spectrum for the best fit that's selected, or the next fit that's selected, shown in the bottom pane here. And there's several in this uh, library that have the same structure since I search many different libraries. There will be some redundancies. So I'll quickly step through a couple of those, another 16, same structure. The next one shows the base molecule as you look at it, but now the carbonyl part of the molecule is missing. So another piece of information, and there's a couple of those that have from different libraries. The next one down is somewhat interesting. It shows that, yes, the oxygen has been inserted in this part of the molecule, and the benzene ring has disappeared. So... As I told you before, you can also resort by going up to the top column here and hit O match because as part of the hybrid search, it did an identity search. And so I'll resort. You can see the highest hit there is 571. And if I click on it and look at the bottom over here, there is some information. It tells us this part of the molecule is present 
that thinks that oxygen is present in the molecule, but instead of the ethyl group, we have a T-butyl group here as the ethyl. So the ethyl carbamate, we have a T-butyl carbamate group in this part of the molecule. Here I have summarized the proposed identification using the hybrid search data. You can see in one case for our best hit, we've inserted an oxygen to get the structure below. In the next one, we take this base molecule and the carboethoxy group has been added to give the carbamate. And in this final example on the right, the phenyl group has replaced one of the hydrogens to get the proposed structure. And this is the case in many of the hybrid search results. You often get many different delta masses that tell you something about the proposed structure. So it's very good to step through them quickly and analyze the data, put together in your mind the proposed structure. And also, of course, always take a look by resorting and looking at the identity search results because additional data can be found there about the molecule also. As you're stepping through the results in the hybrid search, I'll select the top one which had the best fit of 813. In this middle display, you'll see the unknown on the top in color here. And on the bottom, you'll see the best hits hybrids search spectrum in color. So as I mentioned before, anything that's been in gray has been shifted by 16 over to the delta mass to show it in color. And those colors will be this color here, like the molecular ion has been shifted here by 16. Any ion that stayed the same that was not shifted in the spectrum will remain in color here. So if you can somewhat just ignore the gray, what you do is visually compare that of the hybrid search spectrum of the reference to that of the unknown. You can step through all of them that way. We'll jump down to the one that had 72. The same thing has occurred there. So that, that colored spectrum on the bottom is the one that's used to generate the hybrid search results. You can also, as I mentioned before, if you want to, let's pick the best hit, 813 here on the left side, and then we'll go over to the middle display, and you can right click on it and say neutral loss display. Now you can see the neutral loss spectrum for comparison. In this case, the reference spectrum, everything has been shifted starting at zero and showing the differences, and in the same for the unknown on the top. Let's compare now the fragmentation for our unknown versus the proposed structure. And to do that, we'll use MS Interpreter. So I go to the top working area up here, right click on it, and say Send to MS Interpreter. As you can see here, we don't have our structure here yet, and there's many ways to correlate the structure to the spectrum of the unknown, including the librarian function and others, and I've talked about that on my training courses on my website, but I'll do the simple one here. So first we'll go draw our structure, so I'll go to a drawing program. I've already drawn it for convenience and selected it. I'll just say edit, copy, and that'll put it in the clipboard. Now we can go back to MS Interpreter. And what you do here is just click in the structure area and you use your keyboard equivalents on your computer, control V, the standard Windows one, to paste into the structure. And as I said before, you can see here that uh, here's our molecular ion selected right here. And you can see that it uh, shows it all in red, but you can click on any part ion in the spectrum and it'll show you what part correlates to that part. And as I said before, if the spectrum is all in black and with some colored ions to show some more complex rearrangements, then it's a very good indication that our proposed structure correlates with that of the unknown. And of course, anything that's in white, it could not explain. But in this case, you can see it can explain almost all the ions in the spectrum, so it's a good fit. We did some additional work to support the identification first being an IR search in Wiley Know-It-All to confirm the ethyl carbamate group. Wiley Know-It-All software is very useful for unknown identifications. It's a vendor-neutral data processing solution that processes infrared, Raman, mass spec, NMR, and UV data. It supports over 170 vendor data formats, and it also has its own adaptive MS search that gives results very similar to the NIST hybrid search. The spectra included with the software 
includes 264,000 infrared data and also a, a lot of mass spec data, 1.25 million EI spectra and the other spectral techniques also. Here we have the infrared spectrum of the unknown and I asked one of my infrared friends what he thought about it as uh, compared to my proposed structure and he said well, it looks good with respect to the ethyl carbamate carbonyl here but he said I would expect to have some hydrocarbon frequencies in this area but this lump looks a little strange uh, looks a little out of place but I went ahead and did the search did the search of uh, SWG drug library and it did find this citrate is the best hit pretty low 55 percent comparison and it always compares the things here at the top so if you want to compare the spectra so it really bothered me that that lump was there so one good thing that the know-it-all software has one of the many good things that it has is the ability to search mixtures and that's very important when doing infrared because often compounds and mixtures and you can pick up to five mixtures to search uh, to say it's composed of as many as five components let's just pick two and do the search again see what results we get takes a little longer this time what it's doing is trying to compare all the spectra in the library that I picked and find any two that have the minimum amount of residual leftover after it does the hit quality index. You can see it jumped up somewhat to 62% here. And now over on the right side, you can see the proposed structures that it would think would be in this two component mix. And when you're looking at infrared data, you're not looking for an exact structure, you're looking for functional group information. So looking with that in mind, I see my ethyl carbamate group for the carbonyl here is the unknown on the top showing the carbonyl and it thinks the other component might be the HCl salt of this other component so it's saying possibly there's an HCl component present as its salt in the mixture so if we click on the best one I'm going to the bottom there's the composite spectrum here we can pick the salt you can see some of this hump that we see in our unknown here here's the best the spectrum of this salt on the bottom matches this hump that we were concerned about in the spectrum. Uh, if you, then you can pick the actual carbamate. You can see the carbonyl matches up well. So from the infrared data, we would say that it's a mixture of a salt and that of the ethyl carbamate type species. As this infrared spectral overlay of cocaine is shown, we note that drugs are often found as their hydrochloride salts and you can see this lump that initially bothered me in the infrared spectrum indicates the presence of a salt in the infrared spectrum so you can see here in the red is the free base of cocaine and here is the the dash part is the cocaine hydrochloride spectrum the other very useful piece of information was obtained from a, another group the IR and mass spectral data match that obtained from a CLIC member laboratory upon request from the original investigator. Uh, this group would be a very valuable resource to people that are in this area of identifying seized or illegal drugs. So if we summarize everything, the final conclusions from our data would be that the sample is actually a mixture probably of a mixture of the hydrochloride salt and possibly the free amine, but of course that was seen by the infrared but when you inject it on the mass spectrometer for GCMS analysis, the HCL dissociates from our com compound to give the observed free base in the GCMS analyses. At a later date, I did some searches using ChemSpider using my hybrid search results. And I did some separate videos that I include on my website for using ChemSpider and SciFinder with hybrid results, these spectralist type database to do known unknowns to find further information. But here I'll show you the result for this one using ChemSpider. And I found one additional structure. I searched by the molecular formula, even though I didn't have accurate mass data from the hybrid results, I knew what a good proposed molecular formula would be. And I also searched on this similar part, part of the molecule here. To find these two possibilities and I used a Tanamoto search that finds similar compounds so it didn't restrict where the atoms occurred 
in those proposed structures. You can see our top one is our, the one that we proposed. And if you sort by the number of data sources or the total number of references, it came up as the most likely. But there were some in the literature that showed this other structure where the nitrogen is now in the ring. And if you looked at the mass spec and the infrared for this, it would be very similar. It would be hard to determine uh, which one was which based on that data alone. But of course, we did have the data from that outside laboratory that confirmed our proposed structure. Here is another real-world example of the identification of a PCP-related compound. This work was done by, by myself and David Sparkman. Of a white powder, we used the NIST hybrid search. I also wanted to show you how to use spectralist databases such as SciFinder and ChemSpider to get additional information, and also some chemistry. So in the NIST search, you can see our unknown on the top here. It appears to have a molecular weight of approximately 295. So we'll do a hybrid search on that. So we'll go up here on the top, telling it to run the search. When we get through, we can see our best hit has a batch factor of 817. If you look at the spectrum in the bottom corner, you'll see this uh, is somewhat of a, it's a PCP related material. And if you look at the comparison of the best hit here, you can see, if you ignore the gray, you can see that it shifted these ions by a delta mass of 54 to get these fragments here. And also the molecular ion of the best hit has been shifted 54 also to match up. So if you, it's a fairly good match, 817. So as he did before, I'm going to the right up and down key on my keyboard and step through a couple of them. I can see the next one down it doesn't seem to be related at all and it's dropped off in the match factor. And if you step through that, you really don't see the consistent type results that would support this first one. So really the only result we have is this first one to work with. And we'll also do the O match over here. We're resorting it by O match to see if it might tell us something uh, that's related to that the other structure. And if you step through some of those with the up and down arrows and be looking at the bottom and the hit fact hit quality for this identity search that it did first before it did the hybrid score. Uh, really, again, nothing of much use. So let's summarize our mass spec results for the unknown. The hybrid search indicates it's a PCP-related compound, that is, having this part of the structure here. The, the delta mass value of 54 from the hybrid search is unfortunately not associated with any values that I have in my delta mass table. We got a real critical piece of information, that being the DART analysis that gave us the molecular formula of the unknown. The best match has a molecular formula of C17H23N, so this indicates the addition of a C4H6 type species to this compound in some manner, which adds an additional double bond equivalent over that of the best match. So let's summarize it in structures below. The best match has seven double bond equivalents with a molecular weight of 241. We've added C4H6. We now have a compound that has eight double bond equivalents. And in particular, this part over here that I've drawn is just like a red circle has three double bond equivalents that we have to account for. We propose some structures from chemistry for our unknown. We consider the chemistry to propose three structures. And the structure, the chemistry that they use to make these classes of compounds is they start with some ketone, with some base amine, and do some chemistry to get the ring materials that are PCP related. So I found this in the literature. And then I started looking around for ketones that were very common. And I found three very common ones that you could purchase, and I did this by looking at several different databases such as the CAS Registry, ChemSpider, things that were in the NIST search that had this molecular formula for this ketone, and found three possibilities. So I did some paper chemistry. I let this combine to form this material, unknown number one proposed structure, this uh, adamantinone type structure ketone starting to react with this reactive center to give this species number two, and finally this other ketone to give species number three. 
So here are the conclusions leading to the identification of the unknown. The hybrid search was critical in suggesting a PCP-related substructure. The delta mass was not easily associated to a definitive fragment in my delta mass table, unfortunately. The molecular formula from accurate mass DART was very important. Initially, the molecular formula and the double bond equivalents plus chemistry were used to propose three structures. These structures, the structure was finally confirmed down to one structured by 2D proton carbon NMR data as the structure shown below. And without the NMR data, it would be really hard to decide if it was structure one, two, or three, but with the NMR data, it was definitively determined to be this structure shown below. But that was, that's somewhat hard to do to go through all the chemistry, so I wanted to see if I could use spectralist approaches using ChemSpider and SciFinder to see if I could identify it in that way from some of the data that I had. Here is an approach using SciFinder and our mass spec results to identify the unknown. We use SciFinder in to search the CAS registry with a molecular formula and some of the things especially with respect to structure limiting the results were not discussed in our original work using SciFinder in our papers in ASMS so I made a separate video that you can find on my web page to discuss it but anyway the results of the SciFinder results for using that molecular formula gave me 4342 results and that's really too many results to look through so you need to refine the search in some manner and you can always filter your original search over here in SciFinder in by many different parameters. So refining this search was best done by using structural information. And again, this wasn't described in our original work, but is shown in a separate video on the web page. So we wanted to set up and allow no substitution of both rings by including hydrogens. So we drew the structure to limit the search and we put hydrogens here that means no branching can occur where any hydrogen is shown so the only branching in our search results we're going to take those 4,000 that we found and limit it by only ones that occur with this branching here to find some good fits and so only two of the 4,342 results had consistent structures when you limited by this structure below Result number one had nine references. You can always see the relevance. They always sort them by different characteristics. The first being relevance, the number of references associated with it, and four suppliers. So they thought this had much more relevance. And you can see the substructure here highlighted in color that shows what part of the structure was limited in the search. And we only got two. And this is the one that we finally identified the material. So that would have gotten us very much closer without having to consider any of the chemistry so it's much simpler in that regard and this is one of the other structures one of the three that we proposed and fewer references so this would be the best guess initially from the data so now let's try the search using Kim Spider as opposed to SciFinder and again the especially the substructural limitation of this search was not discussed in our ASMS article but it is on my website so let's use the monoisotopic mass search window to limit the to find the number of candidate structures. You could have used the molecular formula, but I just wanted to show if you didn't have a molecular formula and you had an accurate mass, you can use that data within ChemSpider to get the result. So I put in the fat mass that was noted by the DART data, 295.2300, and put some limiting mass accuracy associated with it. And when I did that, I got 4,238 results. Again, too many to look at to find the structure that we want to identify. So what I did was I took these results and then limited it by using a Tanamoto, which is a similarity search based on structure. And I put in the structure for our best match in our hybrid search shown here to limit the search and to use the Tanamoto option and a good place to start with the Tanamoto search is about 90% certainty. And when I did that search, I only got one hit, which is the desired material that we identified using the other data. So a very good approach. Uh, and again, ChemSpider is a free approach. Why 
while SciFinder N is much more powerful in many ways, but it does have a fee associated with it. I'll discuss here the differences in the EI fragmentation of these PCP-related compounds as it relates to the hybrid search. The major differences between the neutral loss spectra of the three compounds is shown below. You would think that the PCP having the same substructure would be very similar to that of the other two, but you can see that it shows a very much different loss of 43 that's not apparent in the other two compounds. This same mechanism for loss of 43 is just not accessible for the top two compounds because you really need to do three carbons in a row, while here, due to the fused rings, you cannot lose the 43 ion, and it changes the fragmentation totally. If the best hit for the molecular weight of 241 was not present, the hybrid search would have failed to yield useful information for this search, which is very important to have diversity in your databases to make sure that they expand over to find new compounds that you have interest in. Here's a detailed mechanism showing how this compound PCP fragments and you can see that it loses, like we said, the C3 fragment to go to 200 that's absent in the other two. And if you're interested in how the other two compounds fragment their fragmentation mecha mechanism, you can find it on my website. So let's summarize what we've talked about. The hybrid search is a very valuable addition to the identification process. It extends the utility of all commercial and user EI and MSMS libraries to identify compounds whose spectra are not present in any of these libraries. It's just one of the many tools in my toolkit to identify unknowns, including spectralist databases such as SciFinder in searching CAS registry and the searching of Chem Spider, IR data, NMR data, accurate mass data, chemistry. So I hope I've convinced you that in many cases someone knows the identity of my unknown. I just need to find that information by using some of these tools. You can find free detailed training for the EI hybrid searches and the other techniques on my website. I've created a handout to go along with the presentation today, and in this handout you'll see hyperlinks to references in the presentation. So in the text of, the, of this handout you'll see numbers, and when you click all these in the PDF document, it'll carry you directly to the topic of interest on my website. I would like to thank all the contributors to this work, including all the people at NIST, the people at Eastman Chemical Company, Anthony Williams, formerly of Kim Spider, but now works for the EPA. Stacy Edwards at the ETSU School of Pharmacy in Johnson City. And all the group at Wiley that worked on the know-it-all software. So for the time I have left, I'd like to give you a brief tour of my website, A Little Mass Spec and Sailing. Of course, it'll include a copy of the video from today and the handout, but also many free tutorials on how to use the software and many other topics, including chemical ionization, surfactant identification, helium conservation, etc. So here's the portal, the opening page of my website, a little ms and sailing.wordpress.com. And at the top, you'll see available on the date of the seminar approaches. That includes all the videos that I've made that in support of this, including the video that we're presenting here, in addition to handouts. So you can go there and get that easily, but also I always include things at the top that I think will be useful to a lot of people. But on the side, we have all the topics that I discuss on my webpage, and there's a lot of them over the years. You might find other things that are useful to you. I think one of the ones you'll find most useful if you go to this one here, Free Courses for Unknown Identification Using the NIST Search. I divided this page into two parts, one on EIGCMS shown here and one on LCMSMS NIST search software. Of course, you would, most of you would find the EI, I think, more interesting, so let's open it. And you can see here on this page we have recordings of videos, training videos, on these topics that are discussed with associated handouts. So we have one on the, the basic searches. We can do structure searches, AMDIS, advanced hybrid search would be particularly useful to you if you want to learn how to use it. 
and then also uh, creating use and retention indices for compounds that have similar mass spectra, almost identical mass spectra, but different retention times. And then also a bunch of different resources that one would find useful in support of these videos at the top of the page here. So let's go back a page and take a look at the MSMS type training. So we'll click on this. You can see it's very similar in the other in that they're YouTube videos showing all the different aspects of doing MSMS searches and associated detailed handouts and resources that are useful in doing the other components of this web page. So let's go back to the top page and look at the Wiley software training. I spent a lot of time developing a course for it to show how to use all the software. And it has many of the aspects that are found in the NIST search software. So they have an adaptive search, which is very similar to the hybrid search. And they have regular searches, ways to search by structure, a very good deconvolution software uh, that's very similar to Ambit's, but it's very easy to use and very powerful and fast. Uh, the only thing that they don't have is probably something that corresponds to MS Interpreter. But they did make their software, so it's easy when you're processing it, it actually send your spectrum over to the NIST search and easily get to the MS interpreter software so one could use it. So I go back and forth. There's certain parts of the NIST search that I like better for certain applications and there's certain parts of the Wiley, but I do like to use both of them in unknown identifications. On the top page, I think you'll find a link that will be particularly interesting to you. It's on the Forensic NIST 2022 workshop on C's drug analyses that was given last year, or late last year. If you go to that link, you'll see my presentation, all the different ones, but realistically, that's all been included with more information in the current video that I'm recording, so that wouldn't be so much interest, so much interest to you, but this link to all, I think, would be. And it contains all of the talks that were giving, given during that workshop, and they're all related to C's drug analyses in some way. So I think you might find those useful. Let's go take a look at some of the topics over on the side. One that I think is particularly useful is the one that's on trimethylsidylyl derivative, but it's listed under Sidylation Artifacts over here on the side. So click on that. When you go there, you'll see all the different types of functional groups and that can be derivatized with BSA or BSTFA or other silylation reagents. And also there's a real good general link to a general derivatization paper here. But the point that I want to make here is that a lot of compounds that you might be interested in identifying do not really go down a GC column very well without being derivatized. So to get useful data on them, you need to form trimethylsidylyl derivatives. So there's lots of different derivatization reagents and conditions but find one that works for you. But whatever you do, find one and learn how to use it. You can buy the reagent. It's really easy to do. You add a solvent, dissolve it up, heat it for 70 degrees for 10 or 15 minutes and inject it on the GC and you get the results. And you'll find a lot of things that would not come off the column, come off the column as their trimethylsidylyl derivative. And more importantly, NIST has spent a lot of time in the last three to nine years adding new TMS derivatives of all the compounds that they acquire, that they purchase as their TMS derivatives. They also usually acquire the turn them into methyl derivatives. They form TFA derivatives, sometimes tertiary butyl, dimethyl silyl, uh, methyl esters, etc. But the most important one is the TMS derivative. So learn how to use it and add it to your toolkit. It's easy to do and I think you'll find it very useful in your work. Again, I'm going over to the side here to find chemical ionization. We do a lot of chemical ionization in our laboratory to determine exchangeable protons, to determine maybe if you had a free OH versus an ether. We do it to determine the molecular weight. We've got lots of tips and papers. There's a JASMUS article that talks about ammonia chemical ionization, which is my favorite. But you can also use liquid reagents if you didn't want to use a gas because it was hard to get a gas cylinder in your lab for one reason or another. But this is very helpful in trying to, this is very complementary to hybrid searches because to do a hybrid search, you really need to know the molecular weight of the compound. And sometimes you can determine that using their software. 
Sometimes you can determine it by looking at the spectrum yourself. But in many cases, chemical ionization is the way to go in trying to get a molecular weight. And it's not that really hard to do. We have an instrument that's from Thermo that allows you to exchange the ion volume. So we could be doing EI in a second, and then in a minute or two later, we can switch over and do chemical ionization. So there's not any downtime. You don't have to vent the system. Now, some of the MSD systems, maybe by Agilent, that could be somewhat more problematic because you have to vent the systems maybe over lunch and then do your chemical ionization after lunch. But it's still doable, and the Agilent instrument does do good chemical ionization on the mo most current instruments. Another course that I developed and have on my website is surfactant identification. Surfactants can be very complex mixtures of components, which makes them very difficult to identify in many cases. But we have some simple tricks and approaches that makes it that makes one able to identify these surfactants. And I don't know, surfactants are in everything. They're in a lot of different materials. They're all in our environment. So I thought it might be useful for some of you, maybe if you needed to do surfactant identification, to have an approach that would be useful in your laboratory. And like I said, it was I developed it originally as a course that I gave at PitCon one year, but I decided I didn't want to do the course again, so I decided just to share it on the internet. So it's free. It's out there. Give it a try. One last thing to share. I wanted to talk about Orbitrap data. So if you click on Orbitrap Differences EI Spectra here on the right, you'll go to the page that talks about our experiences with Orbitrap. We have an LCMS Orbitrap and a GCEI slash chemical ionization Orbitrap. And they're great instruments. Very, very sensitive, very high mass accuracy, very good isotopic fidelity, which makes it easy to determine one molecular formula for higher molecular weight compounds than some other instruments. And also, you can easily change between EI and CI because it has an exchangeable ion volume, much like Thermo's uh, quadrupole instruments. Quadrupole instruments. That's, it's very easy to switch back and forth. The only caution I would note is that the EI spectra can be significantly different and give lower hits to the library searches than a traditional quadrupole. And we've shared that in a study comparing 480 spectra here on this page, if you want to take a look at the differences. But overall, uh, they have been great additions to our research laboratory. But you have to just be a little, a little careful about adding these spectra to our user libraries that we share with people with quadrupole instruments. So in conclusion, I hope today has been useful to you and you've learned some tricks that you can apply in your own work and find some other things useful on my website. So. It's been a pleasure to speak to you. Good day.